I think we will uh, move on to the to the last speaker of the, of the session. Okay, so uh, so let me now introduce. I mean, the last speaker of the session, as I said, Jean-Philippe Brantu. So Jean-Philippe Brantu is a tenure track assistant professor at uh, EPFL. Okay, and he's also a fellow of the Sanders Family Foundation for Academic Promotion, and his uh, research. Are concerned with cold atom uh, technologies, quantum technologies, and particular uh, cold atom transport in mesoscopic uh, structure. And uh, he will now talk about probing and controlling strongly correlated matter with few photon fields. I'm repeating the title for the second time. Okay, so Jean Philippe, uh, please, the, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. So, um, so thanks a lot also for the kind introduction. Um, and thanks also for setting up this uh, online meeting, which sort of reminds us also that that there is still something like a scientific community and uh, that we, we actually appreciate talking to each other and, and seeing each other's work. Um, so my talk uh, is going to be about probing and, and controlling strongly correlated fermions uh, with few photon fields. Uh, and by few photons, I mean photons trapped inside the hyphenous cavity, which this, this drawing is supposed to illustrate. Um, the idea behind this project, uh, which is what I started when I, I started my lab uh, four years ago at EPFL, is that we'd like to consider uh, ultra cold atoms as sort of a bulk material. It, it's a bulk material of a very strange kind that, that we control essentially down to the ultimate details. We have a lot of uh, um, degrees of freedom for the microscopic Hamiltonian. The idea would be to take this system and sort of build another layer of complexity or functionalities on top of it. And the one which uh, I'd like to add here uh, is the control and interaction with light. So to some extent, um, I could have named this presentation quantum uh, optoatomtronics. So that would have been a kind of a bit of crypt a cryptic name, but uh, that, that's sort of the idea you, you, I would like to convey in particular um, that we follow a path that has been well-developed in condensed matter physics uh, by which one can sort of make optical devices out of, of uh, well-controlled materials. So uh, before I come to the details, I would like to credit the people who have actually done the experimental work I'm going to report on. Um, and these uh, are mainly Kevin Ru, Hideki Konishi, Victor Helsen, and, and, and Timo Zvetler, who joined us recently. Uh, and, and I'm mostly going to describe one experiment uh, uh, in my group. There's a second one being set up, and I can comment on that if you have questions uh, later. So. Um, let me start by uh, locating a little bit the landscape uh, and the context of this research. So uh, I would like you to think uh, about the different kinds of uh, light matter interaction that, that one can have on these two, uh, sort of sorted along these two directions. On the vertical axis here, I have the light matter coupling strength. And if one looks at uh, simple systems, in particular individual atoms, as we know them in AMO physics, but more and more nowadays solid state systems like quantum dots and, and of course, um, Cooper pair boxes and single, uh, uh, um, single artificial atoms, these are systems which uh, we control very well uh, because they consist of very few particles that are not strongly correlated with each other. And as a result of this, the light matter coupling can be understood in a very nice way to the point that you can use these systems uh, for quantum information processing tasks as the elementary building block. So uh, this, is, this is one type of system where coupling, the coupling with light is so strong uh, that it can be used to generate nonlinearities that are useful for quantum information processing. Uh, now there's an other axis on which you can consider the systems, and this axis represents sort of the complexity of the material, so how strongly correlated the underlying material actually is. Um, and of course, as we cruise sort of from single systems or very, uh, very simple systems to strongly correlated systems here, uh, we go from single body physics to many body physics. The first step towards that is to take not a single atom, but a collection of atoms that are essentially in the same quantum state, that's a bose einstein kernel state. And this is something that has been achieved already uh, in our community over the last 10 to 15 years with the coupling of a bose einstein kernel state to the field of a high finesse 
2017. These are studies that 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 go on uh, now at several uh, universities in the world based based on these pioneering experiments. If you want to go now to the extreme on this uh, direction, what you have is, is very complex condensed matter systems. So this is, uh, for example, uh, uh, a compound uh, which is a high TC superconductor that, that one can make superconducting by sh shining light on it. This is a pretty famous experiment by Andrea Cavalieri. But you have more and more devices uh, nowadays, especially with the onset of new types of quasi two dimensional materials that are optically active, in which you can have both strong light matter interaction in an optical device together with, with uh, intrinsic correlations in, in matter. And, and I want to mention one experiment here, uh, which is a high TC superconductor that's in close vicinity of a uh, gold mirror, in which the, the coupling to uh, surface plasmons um, is supposed to, to be. Uh, uh, to lead to an uh, enhanced uh, critical temperature for the superconducting material that is placed here. These are experiments by Thomas Ebison, for example. And of course, if you look at these this systems here, um, these are extremely complex, uh, uh, co complex kind of, of materials. Um, there, you have all kinds of, of uh, uh, inhomogeneities. You have disorder. Um, you have uh, uh, a, a very uh, diverse sources of uncertainties, and that, that means these experiments are, are extremely difficult to interpret. So it would be highly desirable if one could take systems on that side and build the complexity gradually to the point that we could cover continuously the regime crossing over from very well controlled individual particles up to the point uh, where we have strong interaction while keeping the light matter coupling constant. And, and this is something we would like to do. And there has been many pioneering experiment, again, with both Einstein Kern and say turned into mud insulator uh, using optical lattices and theory associated uh, with that has been, uh, uh, has been done as well. So what I would like to report on in this talk is our experiments where we sort of take the, the, the extreme tip of this axis by taking a unitary Fermi gas, so, so one of the most strongly correlated material that exists, um, and at the same time, couple it strongly to light in a high finish cavity. So what I'm going to tell you about is first how this, this Fermi gas with tunable interaction is actually prepared in a high finesse cavity and how one does actually achieve uh, the strong coupling regime. And then I will show you uh, some phenomenon which we've discovered uh, where strong interaction and strong light matter coupling conspire to give rise to a new set of excitations by which uh, photon coupled directly to pairs uh, in the Fermi gas. And this is something we call pair polaritons. I will then show you an application of that um, uh, to not minimally destructive measurements. And if time permits, I'd like to show some more recent uh, results uh, by which uh, we can see another type of uh, coupling between light and matter. It's a dispersive coupling where the photons interact not with individual atoms or individual excitation, but with collective modes, uh, in particular density fluctuations. So let me start uh, essentially from the, the experiment that, that we've been setting up with the tunable Fermi gas uh, and the high finesse cavity. Um, I'm not going to say a lot about the experimental setup. Um, if you're interested in some of the technical aspects, uh, uh, you can uh, see these two articles in which we give some details about the experimental setup itself. Um, here, I just want to explain the high finesse cavity, uh, which consists in these two mirrors that you see here that are separated by something like four centimeters. Um, and this high reflectivity mirror define uh, the high finesse cavity, which I'm going to talk about. Um, if you're not from, from the field of cavity QED, these numbers probably don't mean too much for you. The one and single most important one is this one, that's the cooperativity. Uh, and that's the thing I'd just like to explain briefly. Uh, what this number means uh, is the following. Take a single atom, a uh, two-level emitter inside your cavity, and place it in the excited state. Now, um, when this uh, atom de-excites, it will emit a photon. Uh, what the cooperativity measures is uh, how likely is it for this photon to be emitted in the mode of the cavity um, compared with the likelihood it is to be emitted everywhere else in free space. Uh, 
In other words, when the cooperativity exceeds one, all the light matter interaction processes are dominated by the interaction between one particular mode uh, and the atom compared with every other dissipative process. Another way to say that is that if you are to measure, um, uh, to, to perform a measurement on this system, um, if your cooperativity exceeds one, by measuring the uh, uh, photon from the cavity, you're actually dominated by measurement back action as opposed to spontaneous emission. So, so this, is, uh, this is the physics that's behind this. So, and the cooperativity is a purely geometric parameter that's only uh, a feature uh, of the mirrors themselves. And that's the number we achieve. So we are uh, entering the, the strongly correlated, the, the, the sorry, sorry the, the, the strong coupling regime. This is for a single photon and a single atom. If you want to know more, I really recommend this review article from, from the Vladan Vuletic group, which explains this in a crystal clear way. Um, so this is the, the setup we have built with that particular cavity. Now I make a, a, a two and a half year long story uh, short in one slide. So uh, with this setup, uh, now we've, we've produced a unitary Fermi gas uh, straight in between the two mirrors. Uh, and, and, and these are the performance of the setup. We typically work with 300,000 atoms in each of the uh, lowest hyperfine states. We achieve temperatures slightly lower than the 10% the of the Fermi temperature, depending on the exact conditions. Now, it's pretty efficient in particular because we can make use of the cavity also in the cooling process. And again, if you're interested in the technical aspects, please, please uh, I refer you to this to this paper. Okay, uh, so let's now start uh, to investigate the light matter coupling uh, in this particular settings. Uh, to do that, we need to know a little bit more about the energy diagram of, of lithium. So these are the two states that we'll be interested in, the S and P. We work at large magnetic fields because the feedback resonance which we are addressing to produce the unitary Fermi gas is at 832 Gauss. And this is a regime where the atom is very deep in the passion back regime. So that makes also light matter interaction uh, slightly easier to, to grasp. The levels uh, which matter here are the two hyperfine ground states up and down. They are separated in energy by the hyperfine splitting. This is about 80 megahertz. Um, and then there's, they, they are, both these states are coupled to an excited state here uh, uh, from the P uh, manifold. And now we're going to probe the system with the two spin states inside the cavity by transmission spectroscopy. So everything I'm going to tell you about uh, in this presentation is going to be about this transmission spectroscopy experiment. We send photon on one side, collect them on the other side on a single photon counter and measure the transmission. And we do it as a function of two parameters. One of them is the detuning between the cavity resonance and the atomic transition. And that's basically, we, we set the length of the cavity. Uh, and then um, we place the atom in there. And that defines a certain detuning between the, the fabri perot resonances of the cavity and, and, and the atomic transitions. And once this is fixed, um, we are going to probe here with a laser with, uh, which frequency we sweep. So basically we vary the frequency of the laser we send in and we look uh, whether, there are, uh, whether there are transmissions or not and at which frequency this actually occurs. So um, I, uh, I mean, there seems to be one question, but perhaps I should wait until the, the, the question time to, to answer, right? Yeah, 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 please. Okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, so these are the experiments uh, I'm going to report on. And, and when you do this, this is the kind of, of picture you obtain. So this is a 2D map. So this is transmission probability in logarithmic scale. Um, and you have here this probe cavity detuning and the atom cavity detuning on this axis. So um, if you had just the cavity with no atoms inside, you would just see a straight line here at zero, which would actually represent just the, the pure transmission of the fabri perot resonator. And that's, of course, unaffected by where the atomic transition might ever be. Now, if you do have only the atoms, but no cavity, you would see um, absorption features here located along these oblique lines, which would represent the situation in which your probe laser happens to be resonant with the transition between one of the two ground state and this excited state. That's usual absorption spectroscopy. And now, because of the strong light matter coupling, what we observe is dressed states, which appear in this uh, um, uh, resonances that you observe here, 
we have three modes, two modes of atoms, so spin up and spin down, and one mode for the optical field. So that gives us three families of stress states, one um, here, one here in between the two states, and one here at the bottom. Um, as you see, this seems to be much more complicated than, uh, than the simple picture. Uh, essentially, qualitatively, the features are here. Uh, it, this is simply due to the fact that we have uh, not a single mode cavity, but we have uh, several families of transverse modes, which can also couple to the atoms. And it happens in our system that these modes are located here, uh, slightly below the, the, uh, uh, the main resonance transition. And that, that's the reason why we have several of these horizontal lines here. Each of these horizontal lines would correspond to an actual uh, transverse mode of the cavity that that's, uh, also happens to be coupled to, to the atoms. That's a pattern we understand pretty well. Uh, in particular, all this multimode character of the interaction, we can reproduce nicely uh, from ab initio calculations. Uh, but that proves, in particular, the strong coupling character uh, between the, the, uh, the light and uh, uh, the Fermi gas. There are a few things here which, which are actually a bit more interesting, and that's something which uh, will serve as an introduction to the next section. Basically, um, you have these big uh, lines here, which are very which are essentially where they are expected. That is uh, coupling between the atomic transition and the photons. But we also have other features that seem to appear here in a systematic way. And it looks like there are other ways for the atoms to interact with uh, and to absorb light than these actual transitions. And now um, we have many reasons to think that the cavity is multimode. We can actually see that in the empty cavity. But lithium atom spectroscopy is something we also know very well. And we know for sure that a single lithium atom does not absorb light at any of these resonances. So where does this come from? Well, it actually comes from uh, the fact that the system is actually strongly correlated. And because it's strongly correlated, it has pairs. And now these pairs, they can individually couple with photons in a different way than single atoms do. And this is something which we have studied in details. The idea is the following. So um, suppose you take two atoms, right? And you start to shine light on them. So each of these atoms can, can, can absorb light uh, and bring broad, and being brought from ground to excited state. So the first one can absorb and the second one can absorb as well. If you just had this type of phenomenon, you would just see this big anti-crossing patterns. But now what can happen in particular, if the atoms are close enough to each other is that they can exchange this excitation with each other. And this photon exchange type of interaction gives rise to a dipolar interaction between the two atoms. So that's something which you can easily calculate. Uh, it gives you a minus uh, C3 over R3 potential. Uh, so it's uh, in particular, it has attractive branches. Right? So now um, you have this extra interaction potential that's mediated by light. And sure enough, um, this is deep to actually sustain bound states. And now what you get is that when you send light onto this particular system, you can, of course, bring atoms from ground to excited state separately. But you can also directly send photons, which bring the two atoms to the, from the ground state to this particular state. Here, this is photo association. And uh, these photo association resonances, they are actually molecular transition that happen below the threshold for single atom excitation that's represented by this line here. Uh, and now when we look carefully uh, at the absorption spectrum, so we have again at zero, the resonance uh, between the free atoms and the photons. This gives rise to this huge uh, dress state branch that you see here. And on top of that, we see these very nice features uh, here and there, which represent one of these uh, photo association process. And the cool thing is that if you look at this carefully, you actually see a nice anti-crossing pattern, which means that we are now in strong coupling also for these photo association transitions. And this is, uh, to my knowledge, the first time that such molecular transitions are exploited in the cavity QED context. Uh, and this is something generic. We have seen actually more than 40 of these uh, photo association transitions. Uh, and for most of them, we actually observe these strong coupling patterns. So this is nice. Um, but actually, there is more to it. Because now, um, for a single atom to absorb light, it doesn't really matter whether this, this atom is interacting with some neighboring uh, others. But now we are looking at pairs. And of course, the way, I mean, how close two atoms are 
in the cloud depends on, on, on how strongly correlated the system actually is. And there's a very nice pictorial way to see that if I come back to my graph with the potential, this is distance here between my two atoms. And what I represented is essentially the two body wave function as a function of the scattering length. So you have at large distances, you know, this is the Fermi wavelength, if you want. These are just a, a relative wave vector between my two my two atoms. But at short distance here, I have the condon point uh, of this molecule. So this is the place where this actual transition is most likely to take place. This is a much shorter distance than the Fermi wavelength itself by at least an order of magnitude. And what you see is that if you go from BCS to BEC, that is if you change the scattering lengths in the system, the likelihood that two atoms are close to each other is going to vary dramatically. And that is something which we can actually see. So if we look now at the same transition and we follow it all the way from BCS to B, uh, from BC to BCS, we see this continuous change of the Hobby frequency. Uh, so, so the splitting that we observe directly in these spectra um, as the interactions are uh, varied. So this is something which uh, we can measure. Uh, Yes, this is something we can measure in detail. So we have followed four different photo association lines be, be, uh, belonging to different families of molecular potentials. Uh, and all of them show the same trend. Uh, so you see this smooth, continuous evolution from large couplings at the BEC side to, to weaker couplings to the, on the BCS side. And the thing which is really striking is that even though we are looking at megahertz uh, energy scales, you know, scales which are uh, sort of of the order of the light matter coupling, right? The natural line width is smaller than this. Uh, we do see variations due to varying interactions, which are uh, large at that uh, um, at, 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 at that uh, scale. And in particular, that scale is much much larger than the Fermi energy of the cloud. And this is something which is actually quite surprising. Uh, because the many body physics takes place at the scale of the Fermi energy. So uh, naively, you would expect that if you probe the system at, at scales that are 100 times the Fermi energy, there's never going to be any many body physics showing up. But here it turns out that this molecular coupling is actually extremely sensitive to the interactions, which makes it also a, a nice tool to investigate these interactions in details. So um, this smooth evolution uh, also suggests that it doesn't really matter which kind of uh, molecular transition you're looking at. Right? And, and, and if what I'm saying to you is true, and that what we are seeing is indeed the, the, the two-body uh, uh, two correlations, then this shouldn't actually depend at all on the molecular physics. This is something we can check. So if we take these data now and we normalize by the value we observe at unitarity, essentially all the data collapse on each other. And what this means is that um, this molecular transition actually probes some universal properties of the ground state of the Fermi gas. Uh, it actually turns out that um, um, a small calculation tells you that the square of this Hobby frequency should essentially be proportional to the pair correlation function. And remember this distance argument, we are looking at short distance compared to Fermi wavelengths. And that's a place uh, where we know that this is, uh, uh, this is a universal dependence of pair correlations onto one or a KFA that's called tens relations. And that parameter here is nothing but the contact. And this is something that has been considered heavily in the past. Uh, in particular, there are Monte Carlo calculations um, that have been performed for this parameter. And this is a comparison with theory. There's no adjustable parameter here uh, and it fits pretty nicely. So this, this basically tells us that, that we have a sort of universal connection between the, the quantum optics aspect on the one hand, manifested by this Hobby frequency and the many body physics. There's actually another way to look at these data, uh, which is to, to now say, well, if omega square here uh, is essentially given by the contact, then it means it scales like square root of it. And that's a scaling which we are used to in quantum optics. That's the Tavis Cummings model. So basically, if you put a number of identical emitters in a cavity, uh, the, the Hobby frequency scales like the square root of the number of emitters. So this is something which uh, we have uh, we can see here. That's the bare Hobby frequency as a function of the normalized contact. Uh, we can fit that with a square root. And what this tells us is the magnitude of the single photon single pair coupling. 
Uh, and it turns out that that um, now this is a rough estimate. Uh, it's, it's an order of magnitude, but but the order of magnitude we get for that uh, is essentially identical to that of uh, uh, a single atom with a single photon, which also means that everything we know about cavity QED in the context of atoms can be directly transferred now into the context of uh, cavity QED with pairs uh, in a strongly correlated system because cooperativities are, are of similar order of magnitude. Um, and there's one thing which you can do if you have a high cooperativity, so if you're in the cavity QED settings, is, is weakly destructive measurements. So, so cavity QED is the place where we understand measurements best. And we know in particular that we can perform weakly destructive measurements. So the way this works is that um, suppose you are coupling to an atomic transition, uh, the photons that are inside your cavity, but you're so far detuned that the photons cannot really be absorbed. Then what happens is that uh, you will have a bare cavity resonance, but it's going to be shifted here uh, by, by the dispersive shift, which is the square of the Rabi frequency divided by the detuning. In other words, this is the index of refraction of the cloud uh, you're placing in between your mirrors. And by measuring this, you have access to this Rabi frequency square. Uh, if you just had pure um, atomic coupling, this would be proportional to the atom number. So what we can do is we can perform our transmission spectroscopy measurements um, uh, by sending light in the cavity and probing where this resonance actually is. And if it's indeed weakly destructive um, as, as cavity QED promises, then we can repeat this in time. So we can, we can sweep through the resonance, locate where it is, repeat again and again and again. And that uh, is how we sort of pragmatically define this, this weakly destructive uh, uh, setting. So this is something we, we have done. So now, of course, we want to do it for pairs. So what this means is that we have to operate, yes, thanks, in a regime where, where we have a dispersive coupling due to these pairs that adds to that of atoms. Uh, and, and for that, we use a trick, which is the birefringence of the cloud. Uh, so we, we, we change the polarization of light with respect to the direction of magnetic field. And that gives us two. Um, uh, anti-crossing pattern. So this is a zoom over one of these photo association line. You see here the anti-crossing, but the other polarization does not couple to that particular transition. And therefore, now if you look at this, you can go sort of away from the resonance. So somewhere here, you just do one sweep through this region here. That's a raw data. So these are histograms of photon counts collected on the photon counter. We see two peaks. And these two peaks can determine both the total atom number and the genuine coupling of pairs. And that number we get over a single interrogation of a single cloud. And we can play this game. So repeat this, say, 50 times over 500 milliseconds. So each of these points is one other interrogation of the same cloud. So this is a single realization. And you see, essentially, here, atom number decreasing. So this is uh, uh, the detuning. It's negative. So actually, it approaches 0 as we lose atoms. Um, and the pair correlation function here uh, decreases here. This is the coupling to pairs as it was uh, introduced before. Uh, we can play with these numbers, for example, look at uh, the relative decay uh, with respect to the first uh, uh, measurement we made. So this is normalized by atom number. And what this tells us is that this is essentially constant over the 50 consecutive measurements, which means that the many body physics is preserved as we probe the system over and over. This is something which is nice because now we have this non-destructive tool also for many body systems. Um, I see that I have probably a few minutes left, so I'm just going to introduce this last three, topic. Three minutes. OK, that's perfect. So um, I, I'm going to introduce this last topic. I will just show briefly where we are. And that's, of course, open for discussion if you have questions. So um, think again about this non-destructive measurements and the way it works in general. So we can forget for that part that there are uh, coupling two pairs. I'm just going to think about weakly destructive measurements. And the way this dispersive interaction works, so this index of refraction uh, effect looks like, if you write it down in the Hamiltonian, it's basically the dispersive coupling strength. There is here the number of photons, and there is here um, the overlap between your cloud and the mode of the cavity, which is, is cosine squared. Now, of course, the first uh, explanation I gave you is that, well, this can be interpreted as another contribution to the frequency of your cavity. And therefore, this number can be uh, uh, formulated as, as measuring the dispersive shift. But that's not the only way of interpreting that. 
The same Hamiltonian actually tells you that inside your cavity, you have actually an optical lattice cosine square, which strength is proportional to the total number of photons. And as you send light in your cavity, you have two things happening at the same time. The cavity uh, resonance shifts around depending on how the, the, the uh, density overlaps with the mode. And this overlap is changed because the atoms are pushed by the potential that's created by the measurement field. And that's something which is well known that gives rise to a kernel linearity, which was observed already 15 years ago uh, uh, by the Stamperkern group and by the ETH group on Bose-Einstein condensate. So this is something we've essentially reproduced now for the unitary Fermi gas. Um, how this looks like is that as you sweep through your resonance, uh, your probe laser, uh, the atoms redistribute um, um, due to the fact that you start to have a light entering the cavity and that pushes the atoms away. Um, the net effect is a distortion of the transmission profile and that distortion is a manifestation of the care effect uh, uh, due to this term in the Hamiltonian. I make the story short, this is something we understand. We can fit actually these curves and extract the density response function of the gas from that. Uh, and this is something we do in collaboration with Shun Uchino, who in particular does the uh, calculation for the BCBCS crossover. So this is a measurement of this particular function as we change interactions uh, from, so this is BCS, so it should be a minus 0.5 um, here to, uh, to the BEC regime. This is preliminary. We still have to uh, sort of understand the error bars and the systematics of the theory, uh, but this is also a nice way by which the many body physics and the quantum optics aspect go sort of hand to hand and, and one helps a lot to understand and to control the other. Um, I exhausted my time and, and, and your patience probably as well. So, so let me just summarize briefly where this is going. Um, we have now tools to do non-destructive measurements. Uh, we can measure, of course, atomic population by dispersive measurements. We can measure pair correlations. We have no clue about the actual limits to that kind of measurements. In particular, if we want to measure pair correlations in the best possible way, are we going to hit some, somewhere sort of standard quantum limit? Yes. Or, or, or is there something to understand in, in sort of the back action of this measurement and so on? And of course, this, this dispersive coupling also hints uh, towards the fact that you can use light to control the dynamics of the system and um, induce perhaps new phases. And this is something which is well known again, thanks to in particular the experiments of Tillman uh, Esslinger, uh, that, that for example, if we pump the cavity on the side, uh, we get fenomena such as per density wave ordering, which with fermions is something we would like to study uh, as well. So this is the summary of what I've been uh, telling you about. Uh, and with that, I thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Jean-Philippe. Very nice, impressive talk. OK, uh, are there any questions? Ah, OK, G Gerard, please go, go ahead. Jean-Philippe, thank you very much for your wonderful talk. But of course, you, you made me wonder, and I ask, um, what is the second experiment you're building up? You, you gave us a teaser, but you didn't mention it. Yes, yeah, so, so um, basically, um, and this second, you see, here we do non-destructive measurements um, and we want to reach the ultimate limit of sort of how well can we ever measure a strongly correlated system, right? Uh, but of course, the thing you lose is that you lose a spatial resolution because your mode essentially overlaps with all the atoms. So you have sort of the information in time, as I showed you, but you don't have it in space. And what this second experiment will try to do is to, to combine the two and, and combine the, the cavity QED aspect with local addressing. And for this, we need a setup that's adapted to host both uh, high resolution optics and the cavity at the same time. Uh, this is something we, we've built now that the system works. We have atoms in there, but we are at the very final stage of, of, of setting up. And, and, and if I, if I uh, can enter a bit in the details, the idea of this particular experiment is that we can combine the high resolution optics and the cavity mirrors in a single device by gluing the cavity uh, mirrors and the uh, aspherical lenses together. Uh, and, and, and that's something we have developed by optical contact and, and that actually uh, works, uh, at least optically, the, the, the optics engineering, it's vacuum compatible and so on. So uh, that's something we are pretty happy about. Yes. So, so hopefully soon that there will be some, some results for this. Yeah. So that's, that sounds fantastic. So I'm looking forward to your results and we're looking forward to seeing about them at the next Adamtronics meeting. Thanks.
Any other questions? Simply, I suggest that Roberta Shidro is asking questions. Maybe you can unmute there. Maybe she wants to ask the question directly. Hello, very Roberta. Good, very good. Yeah. Hi, Roberta. Thank you for the nice talk, actually, Jean-Philippe. So I have a question uh, regarding uh, this uh, molecular photo association. Do you have a sort of uh, confinement in use resonance for this uh, molecular coupling? So you mean confinement? Um, um, so, so we are in a harmonic trap in 3D. Um, okay. there's, there's no tight confinement in any direction. I see. So, so mm -hmm. they, I don't expect um, the, the confinement to play a role. Oh, no. Okay, okay, thanks. Well, there are other questions in the question and answer. It's the same, yes. Yes, it's the same. Okay. Frederick has a question. Yes. Frederick, uh, yes. yes. Uh, very nice talk, thank you. Um, I have a question about the uh, pair polaritons. Uh, so at the moment, there are just resonances in your, in your spectra. Uh, is there hope to do some dynamics with them? Just like, well, for instance, the, the people who do exciton polariton experiments uh, with, uh, with the electrons? Ah, okay. So um, um, the answer, okay, it depends, of course, what you're interested in. I mean, um, the, the lifetime of these excitations is essentially the natural line widths of the atoms. Right? So, so they are extremely... Um, I mean, we, we observe them as resonances, but as you said, I mean, they, they, they don't have their own dynamics. If you want, at the scale where the atoms could move, the kinetic energy, there we are back to Fermi energy. So the, the lifetime of these polaritons is essentially zero on that, on that time scale. Now, um, what we could hope to see, but that would be sort of the next level, would be some optical nonlinearities, which would tell us that uh, the polaritons are interacting with each other. Um, and this is something we've, we've not thought about. Our cavity is actually not super adapted to that. We would need a much shorter cavity with, with much larger coupling strength. But in principle, if, if you have a large enough uh, single photon coupling, you can also reach the nonlinear regime. There, however, I don't expect this to be very different from just normal sort of atomic polaritons. Where, where I see the, the, the dynamics aspect is, is if we were able, for example, to use this pair polariton coupling, this, this coherent coupling, for example, to change the scattering lengths, that's a, a sort of optical feedback resonance, uh, which would ha then have a dynamical character due to some uh, um, the, the, the feedback that's that's due to the cavity. Thank you. Okay, I would have just, I mean, maybe a very silly or very naive question, I don't know. The last part of, about this automechanical effect, I mean, this is, or maybe you, you said it, I mean, this is similar to this collective atomic recoil laser effect, this Carl effect. It, it is actually very similar. Um, there, there is a difference in geometry. Uh, I mean, I think to this collective atomic recoil lasing, you, you, you have to come from the side, uh, the cavity, and this is, this is a runaway process which happens due to recoils. So here in some sense, it's simpler. It's on axis pumping again. Um, so this is just the sort of the, the mechanical effects of light directly uh, onto the atom. That there's no runaway process. There is an instability. If you, the care interaction, the, the care nonlinearity is large enough, you get bi-stability. Um, sure. this, is, this is very standard sort of nonlinear optics. Um, uh, but but there's, there's, as far as I know, uh, the, the, that, that's where it stops. I think we would need to go to side pumping. This is something which is going on in the lab at the moment uh, in order to okay. see something beyond this, this optomechanics. Yes. Okay, thank, thank you. There's, there's another question. Um, could you observe yeah. shifts of the transmission due to both hub splitting and photo association with fewer atoms in the cavity? Um, yes, so we can work with fewer atoms uh, there what I would expect, I think we, we have worked with fewer atoms when the experiment was not in, in such a good shape anyway. Um, I mean, it's just the signals get weaker, um, but, but I think the co cooperativity being equal to one means that in principle, you can detect a single of these pairs. Huh? Uh, that's the sort of the cooperativity. You can also think of it as the signal to nose ratio you would get for detecting a single, uh, a single emitter. So you would be able to detect a single atom, uh, or here that would also be uh, the case for a single, uh, a single pair. 
Um, now, as far as we know, and as far as we have seen, the scaling of this pair polariton splitting, so the, the collective Rabi frequency, is like square root of the total number of pairs, which itself goes like um, as the contact varies with total atom numbers. So, so there's, there's no surprise here, the sort of usual scaling uh, applies. Any other questions? Well, uh, if not, then uh, maybe we thank all the, the speakers, okay, of this uh, session. Thank you. Okay.